Hello, good day, and welcome back. And today we're going to jump into Go Fiber Part Ten. Now, there's a lot of material in this video, so in order to try and keep it short, I'm going to try and record this video and hopefully not make a lot of mistakes that I need to edit so I can post it quickly as one, and also so I don't take a lot of time trying to show you how to write code. So hopefully that saves both of us some time. The code is all in the repository, remember that. So whatever code I show, you can literally jump over to the repository link, which is down in the description below and look at the code. All right, so let's jump in. So let's say that you're developing an application. And so, so far we saw some RESTful endpoint for items. So we can create an item, delete an item, update an item, that sort of thing, get a list of an item. But no, we don't want to do this as um, get the data just to REST. We want to actually create like a user interface. Now user interface that I'm showing here could potentially be a web application or a mobile app. Now it could also be a desktop app, but we'll put that to the side and we're just going to say, we're going to restrict ourselves to like a web application uh, or a rest, uh, web browser um, UI. And so if this is the case, I could have a form that allowed me to create an item. And so a uh, form like this on a web browser might allow me to do that. I can put in the name, the price, and a description of the new item. And I can click like create. I can also get a list of the items that I have access to, um, you know, currently in the database or that have been created. And so maybe there's an... Uh, image for to show what the item look like of course the price and the name of the item and the description please do not criticize my ui design here i'm not a ui designer and you do not want me to design your ui click on any item and then i can see some details about that item right so something that this might be like an item detail screen and from this screen i can potentially you know delete this item or go back to showing the list of items or maybe i might have a create button here add a create button here so i can go create another item this is all ui stuff but just for the sake of this example let's say this is the kind of user interface i want so what does that require well i want to talk to you about client-side rendering and server-side rendering and so let's start off with client-side rendering so let's say i wanted to actually implement these three screens. I have them rendered by my browser. What does this entail? What is backing this up? Well, I have my API endpoints where I can get the data or perform the actions to either delete something or get the list of stuff or update it and so on, edit it and so on. But that's just the endpoints that can give me data or perform the action on this um, resource, the item resource. Well, how does this really map to the UI? So the first thing to realize is for the one that creates my list, it needs the list of items. So it, somehow this form, when I open this page or form here is rendered, it needs to go to my backend and get the list of items. And then for a new item, when that form is shown to me and I type in some data and then I click create, that create action on the button should somehow take the data that I enter into those fields package it up somewhere in JSON and then post it to my um, post slash items endpoint so that item can be created. Similarly, when it comes to displaying an item, I need to be able to get the specific item that was clicked on in my list or if I'm going to navigate, provide navigation to that item to see the details, I need to be able to retrieve that item detail so I can then render um, the UI or the form or the page for it. And of course, if I'm thinking about deleting, well, then that delete action should be tied to um, something that's going to call my backend API to say, this is the specific item I want to delete. So now you can see how the UI ties into having these RESTful endpoints or these API endpoints. Okay. All right. So there's a lot of detail here that I sort of into that, but I didn't get into. And that's because we will have way too many lines here. So let's take a little bit. Um, you know, let's dive a little bit deeper. Now, one of the things that I want to cover here, and we'll see it in the code, is how we can abstract the details for our items, for manipulating items. So I'm going to use the term repository 
to mean an abstraction for dealing with this particular resource. So in this case, we're talking about items. So we're gonna have an item repository. And so now our endpoint handlers will then call out to our item repository to create a thing, an item, update it, delete it, and so on. And so the purpose of the item repository is to abstract how we talk to the database. So that database could be a SQL database, it could be MongoDB, it could be any type of storage, file, whatever, it doesn't matter. My item resource kind of abstract that away and just give nice functions or methods for me to be able to call from my API endpoint. And so you might rightly ask, where does this item repository live? Is this a separate piece of code or something? It's kind of a piece of code, but it's still within the realm or the context of our API service. So that's where this thing is. Just We just abstract out all that item related storage and create and delete stuff that we were doing in our endpoint currently. We've abstracted it into this one thing. And the nice thing about this, we can then pass different types of backend that we actually want to store to. Uh, multiple or if one, whatever, it doesn't matter. We can do things like caching and all this other stuff. That's way beyond where we need to be able. I'm just trying to explain why you might want to do something. And you'll see the benefit of doing, being able to abstract this common set of operation from a resource. You'll see the benefit of it when we get into server-side rendering, especially. And so let's say on my, I have a laptop where my browser is running. I have a web server that's going to serve me up some web pages. And I have my API server that's going to give me the data, right? So how do things start off? So let's say what I want is this listing page. This is what I want to see rendered on my laptop or my phone. Let's say I'm using my phone to access this web application. Well, the first thing that happened is the browser actually contact the web server and say, hey, get me the HTML for to list these items. Once the web browser get back this web page, it's going to read the contents of that web page HTML. I might see that oh, oh there's a JavaScript um, file that is being referenced in the um, script tag, and so it could be embedded um, JavaScript code. But in this example, we're going to say the JavaScript is stored in an external file, and so once the web browser reads our HTML, parses it, sees that oh, the, it refers to list that Java, notice, oh, it reached back out to, again, the web server to get the static thing. The JavaScript file, the HTML file, images, those kind of resources are all considered static. They don't change. So now the web browser has HTML and JavaScript. Well, the JavaScript is, telling it, is going to tell it how to fetch the data or where to fetch the data from, and once it get it, how to populate it or update that HTML as right now static. And so this is when the web browser now once it get the JavaScript and start executing the JavaScript code, well then within the JavaScript code, it's going to then say reach out to our endpoint on our API server to say, hey, give me the JSON array that represents the set of items that I need to render. And so it goes ahead and it does that. And then once the page is fully rendered, that's what you see. Now, I show you the page, the result first, but because I'm saying this is what we want. But this is sort of like the rough order things going to happen. Now, there's a lot more to this, and I can't show everything. So, for example, those images that we see, when we got back our items, our list of items in step three, well, the browser, if it look at each item and go to put it on the web page, it would say, oh, I need to get images to put in this place. So that data would then have links to where the images for this item is stored. And it might be back on the web server, it might be some other server somewhere else. And so the browser would fetch those images to make sure that when it's ready to show you the web page, those things are there. All right. So as you can see, this can get really complicated. The key thing to take away from this though, is that the rendering or the putting together of that final page that you see is done by the browser. It has to be fetching the HTML, which is static, fetching JavaScript, fetching images, and you know, then the item, the data, and then putting it together. Note, as I show it here, the web server and the API server are separate. And this can be done for scaling reason, like you can scale the web server with those static pages. You can do a content delivery network that deliver those static pages and your API server or your microservice that is your API server could be scaled in a different way. But if you combine the two, you might say, well, I have a web application 
and it has you know these endpoints for that does restful stuff and then it serves up html or static content which is the html pages and javascript so this is the exact same image as before except now we're going to the same um, server so to speak or same application and now the two things serving up static pages and serving up the endpoint data is within the same application so this is how you might think of a web application okay but this is still client-side rendering whether you combine the web server and the api server or you separate them this is still client-side rendering and so how is server-side rendering different well first of all notice that for our client it's going to make a get request on a endpoint now that endpoint looks very similar to any one of our api endpoint of course it's under the grouping views for example but it doesn't need to include like a file extension because it's not asking for a file it's not telling the web browser um, the, the browser is not saying hey web server send me back a file this is actually to a endpoint where we have a handler and we'll see this in our example code where the code now the handler now can then say all right i know that how you want a listing for items so i can ask the repository to get me a list of items and then it says hey i know that though i need to combine that data or so they might hear people call it the, the model with the appropriate template but notice we did the whole combining of data and the template on the server we didn't send the data to the browser for the browser to combine it and so this is how we know we're doing server-side rendering because the browser the client never got a listing of the data okay so before we get into the code i want to thank our patreon subscriber if you want to be a patreon subscriber please just go check out the links here um, or if you don't want to be a patreon subscriber just subscribe to the channel thumbs up the video leave a comment um, i know there's some comments that i need to respond to i haven't got around to it yet but i'll do that this weekend and so thanks again let's jump into the code so here I'm at the GoFiber website, and if you click on Docs, and then you scroll down to, well, actually, I scroll down, but rather click over here, and then click on Templates. Um, this is where it talks about views and the different template engine that it supports, um, and how you can render templates. So, and then there are plenty of examples, but. Like I said, this video is already going to be um, pretty long, so I'll just leave you to read the documentation. And so I'll actually jump into uh, the code. So I'm in the episode 10 directory. So let's start with exercise 00. So let me start task running here. And so as you can see, we have our RESTful endpoint. But there's something I need to show you that I did. And so let's go here and we have example 001. And if you can tell, I can't keep it straight about whether the first example should be 00 or 01. So example 00. And so I have something called a service, um, services package. And in that package, what I have is something called item repository. Now this hides how we store an item. So this could be a real SQL database, MongoDB, it doesn't matter, right? That hides the detail. And then what we have is that we can create a new repository and if possible, I needed to pass in like, you know, a reference to how I'm actually storing data, I could have done that there, like where I'm persisting it to. But we don't need to, so you just create a new item repository and it prepared a place for us to store our items. Now, because this is actually storing the items into or persisting it, you can think of it that way, it has a representation of what an item looks like that's going to be persisted. So item that's persistent must have the ID and of course name, price, and description. And then there are just some methods that we have to make things, accessing um, certain things easy, right? So for example, we have a method on this item repository that allows us to find an item by ID and that's pretty easy. If we can't find it, we can return error. If we can, we return the item otherwise. Same thing here, um, in terms of creating an item, you just take the name, price, and the description, and you return an item or an error. And then if the price is empty or if the name is empty or the price is less than zero, we return an error message and again, an empty item. 
Um, otherwise, we construct an item that's going to be persistent, and we put it in our database, and then we return that constructed item. Again, you can imagine all this code here is what's going to actually go to an actual database. And then to get an item, well, to get the items is just simply the list of items. And so that's all the repository is doing. So the repository doesn't have any external dependency on anything. I mean, the only dependency you could possibly have is on the thing that it needs to, where it needs to persist the data. And that could be something that we pass in and still wouldn't really have any dependency on an actual like SQL data source or something because we can abstract that stuff away. All right. So now you know what the items um, repository look like. Now we have to use it. So if we go back to main, we'll see that um, what we do is we create a new items repository and we pass that into our items API. And so now our items API as the repository that it should use to, you know, get items and do everything, all anything item related. All this code remains the same as before. So it's only really these two lines. This line has changed by passing something, a parameter here, and then add in this line. All right. And so if we now go take a peek at our API now, we can see that what we have is we import the service. And so we say that our item API has our um, repo feel that's a pointer to our item repository. And remember, that's being passed in upon construction of our new item API. So we just remember that. And now the methods or the handler for our items API, those handlers, well, they just simply use the repo to say, find an item. And if it gets it, it returns it. Otherwise, it um, log an error message. And I could return the error message to the user, but I try to minimize the type of message errors that I send back to the user. And again, you can argue about whether that makes sense or not. I think um, the status code should most times be used and only if you, you have really good reason, then return error messages, but try to minimize the amount of stuff you send back to the client. All right. Um, otherwise, log it. And so you can review the logs. And same thing with creating an item, we're still going to use our custom, um, you know, struct here for when an item is created so we can properly parse it and we know that we have the information we're looking for. But once we do that, we can call the repository, create method, and then pass it those values. Notice the repository doesn't need to know about how we parse the data that came over the wire. So they are completely separate. And again, we do the same thing. If you can create it, uh, great. If you can't, log an error and of course you let the user know similarly here when we call um, the handler to get all items we just delegate that call down to our repository and we return it and we log a message saying how many items we, we got it's not an error if you don't have any items so that's why i don't check or anything to see if this was empty or not so that's how we, our handler uses the service and um, again very little change here and so that works and so if we close this and let's say we go to our web browser and we go here and now we refresh you'll see that we have nothing because we just started our application but let's say we decide to create an item and we decide to create another item and we go back to our web browser here and we refresh we'll see that's what it looked like. Now, this is great if the client consuming the data actually just want data, and then it's gonna render it its own way, maybe like this or in a UI. But we want things to be rendered in um, a nice on a nice um, HTML page, so let's continue. So if I go to example one, let's say you want to be able to serve up static pages. How do you do it? Well, the first thing you do is you create a static page and here's a very static page. There's nothing in here other than um, a table that has some fake data. And so this is an HTML page. And so I want to serve this page up to a client. So if we go back to main, we can see that Fiverr applications support this thing called 
static and basically what you say and basically what you do is you say that's static and you give request path so in this case in b slash views and then you specify a directory and so it basically says anything that is requested here just look in the equivalent path here so if i request you know slash views it's going to try and look for index.html file in this directory and you could configure all that stuff so we're going to ignore all that if I request slash views slash a.html, it's going to look for a.html file in this views directory. So what that means now is from my browser, since slash views match to this views directory, on my browser, I can request slash views slash item slash list.html, and Fiber is going to read that HTML file, that static HTML file, and return it to me. So. If we now CD here, stop this, go into 02, and then I do task and I run there. Uh, oh, I think I went to I went too far. Um, so control C, I was supposed to go to 01 instead. And now I refresh that, and that's exactly what happened. We can see that it's making a request and reading the content of that file. And to show you that the file is indeed being this is the file that's being called i can change this to 42 and that's going to save the file on disk but of course my application doesn't need to change because after i do this it's reading that html file off of disk and so you can see that change all right so that's static now i'm going to tell you a little bit of cheat if you don't want to spend time writing html if you don't know about chat gpt or google's bart please use it um I went into Google Bart. I didn't want to write any HTML. And I said, please give me a table for a, um, a HTML file with a table that contains, you know, name, price, yada, yada. And, you know, it gave me this. And essentially, I could modify it. You can ask the columns you want. And I said, give me two examples. And then you could use that to keep modifying it. Or you can even tell it, give you a table that calls a RESTful endpoint or use Go template. And you'd be surprised just how much you get, like 99% of the code that you need. I'm not interested in doing UI development, so oh, I don't really mind saving the time instead of me trying to write this up, which I could, but I don't care for it. Um, in a few videos, you'll see another cheat that I use for doing UI stuff, but that's coming up. Um, anywho, let's keep going because this is going to take too long. And so we can see that's working. All right, so we want to make this a dynamic page, though, right? Remember what we said? We want to do client-side rendering. So what we want is when the client fetch this HTML, it should in turn go fetch some JavaScript or use JavaScript that's embedded in the page to then fetch the data and populate this page with it. And so if we go to our example in EX02, so we go to EX02, and now we do task, run that, and let's go over here and take a look at it. Let's close this and close up this guy. And so now for, this is the only thing that's changing for now at least, right? We're gonna say, okay, for the HTML page, what I want you to do is embed some JavaScript. And so notice how the body of this table doesn't have those items that we displayed before. Because why? We're gonna update it with the data that we get back from our endpoint. So we write a JavaScript function here. There's an asynchronous function that basically says, go out and fetch from the endpoint, you know, API items. That's going to be JSON. Um, so the response that JSON get it back, which is going to be a array. And so if we do this in a loop, now we're going to be creating a table row for each item in the array. And of course, with all these table data. And so, the only thing left is for us to add a listener to our window. Again, if you don't know JavaScript or HTML and the, how to use the DOM, this, this video is not going to teach you that. I'm not going to spend the time. But basically, we attach a listener to the onload event that says, OK, once the page is loaded, fire off or run this JavaScript function. And then the JavaScript function does exactly what we said, fetch the data and update the DOM. All right, so let's see that working now. So if we go back to our web browser here and we now refresh, well, the thing is because our browser's, browser is caching the stuff, what I have to do is clear my cache. And I'm gonna do that by going to history 
and let's say clear the last hour of cash. I come back here and if I refresh now, you see that it, the list is empty and that's because we started our application and we didn't store any data. But let's post some data. So let's post that. Let's post another um, item. And now if I refresh, you'll see there it is because it's fetched the, um, the first the page and then the page has that JavaScript code that said go on call our endpoint. And so if we paste another thing, so we can say, let's do 42 and then let's do item four, I guess, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. Then we go back to this and we refresh. Notice how we get, um, you know, um, our list is updated, you know. Of course, the ordering, you know, is something else we can sort out, but at least you can see that our page is fetching data from our um, backend. So we're fetching the page, which in turn turn around and make the call to get the data, and then of course update. The last example now is to use server side rendering. And in that example, let's close this. We'll close this. Let's go to exercise 03. And the only thing that's different here, we have to make two changes. One, our template now has to be Go template. And so we can see this is a little bit shorter because why? We're not using JavaScript to make a call to get the data and then iterate over it. Rather we're using Go template. And with Go template, it's assumed that you know the data or model is provided. And so you're gonna range, range over some data. And in this case, it's gonna be a struct value that has a field called items. And that happened to be the list of items you want. And now when you iterate over that range, set the ID to the first item in the list and then for each subsequent item. So when you do that ID, it reports to that current items ID, name, price, and notice how you stuck you stick it inside of the table row data, essentially in the same way. And then you end the um, the range loop here. Now again, this is not a video for this. I made reference earlier to the links that I have talking about Go using Go templates. So do check it out. Now we have this template body that uses Go template. We have to provide the data. So this is where when we go back to our how we set up our application, we can see that, remember we created an item repository that abstract how we talk to or save our resource item? Well, guess what? We can now use that same repository in our item view. And I'm gonna go to that in a minute. But essentially we create a new group called views and we have an endpoint called item in under that view. And now we have a handler for that. Now we could call this, you know, slash, um, this could be items slash list if we want. Um, and so it basically says when this path is um, received, you know, slash views, slash items, slash list, I want this handler to be called. This handler is a method that's attached to this um, item views. Item views contain the repository that we're going to use. Remember I told you that oh, abstracting things into a repository allows us to reuse it. And so therefore now, once our handler here is called, what does it do? It constructs a model that is a struct with an items field, and then it populates that items field with the data that's returned from our repository. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. Again, this video is way too long for that, but the code I think is fairly readable. And now we call the random method on our fiber context to say, hey, I want you to read this HTML page, which is the Go template, and combine it with this model. And the result of that is what you're going to send back. And so notice how I said that you combine the template and the model on the server. And so the result is the HTML data that the client can just render as opposed to the client after fetch the data itself. So I post some data, post some data. I go back here to my web browser and I refresh and there you can see there's the data, right? And notice if I do this, so I clear my screen and I refresh here, notice no matter how much I refresh, 
notice that you don't see anything about getting um, data. So we know that we're not hitting the endpoint here to get data because if you call this endpoint, you would see this re request for all items and we don't see that here. It means that oh, we're not calling that. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. It's a lot, I know, um, but hopefully you learned something. Let me know if you have problems. What do you think? And about the examples as shown and take care. Um, if you have questions, comments, or suggestions, please let me know. If you're not subscribed, please consider subscribing. Appreciate it. If you are a returning subscriber, thank you so much. Take care. See you in the next video.